Turn with me to Luke chapter number 19 this morning. Luke chapter number 19. We're going to take a couple of weeks away from our series in Joshua. And we're going to focus on the events at hand. So this Sunday, as most of us can see, is Palm Sunday. And it's the day where Jesus was triumphantly uh, entered into Jerusalem. And, and the people were singing and, and crying out Hosanna. And they, they saw Jesus... For who he truly was, they saw him as the king of kings, and they saw him as a prophet, and they saw him as a prophet, priest, and king. They saw Jesus for everything that he was, and then just a few short days later, that same crowd is crying, crucify him, crucify him. We think about Luke chapter 19, we'll read verses 28 through 41. The Bible says, Verse number 28 of Luke 19, And when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, and the which at your entering you shall find a colt tied, whereon, ye, uh, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him, and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus shall, say, thus shall you say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way, and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garment upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon, and as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Verse number 41 says, And when he, had, when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hast even known at least in this thy day the things which belong unto thy peace, for but now they are hid from thine eyes, for thy for the day shall come upon thee, that thy enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and can pass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this day. God, thank you for this word. God, help us this morning as we uh, just look at this passage of Scripture, God, and we think about who you are, God. Help us not to miss the fact that you truly are God. And God, you are the Messiah, the one who came to save the world. God, if there's one here this morning that doesn't know you as your Savior, God, I pray that today would be the day. Just say pray. Amen. Amen. It was in December of 1903 that after many attempts, the Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur, were successful in getting their flying machine off the ground and into the air at Kitty Hawk. Thrilled over the accomplishments, they telegraphed this message to their sister Catherine. We have actually flown 120 feet. We'll be home for Christmas. Catherine hurried to the editor of the local newspaper and showed him the message. He glanced at it and said, how nice. The boys will be home for Christmas. He totally missed the big news. For the first time in human history, man had flown. How many of us sometimes we glance at something and we miss the message. We miss the, the important thing. The important thing in that story was not that they'd be home for Christmas. It's that these guys had just flown 120 feet. When we think about the story of Jesus, the story of Jesus is the same way. They had Jesus for 33 and a half years. They saw Jesus as the prophet. They saw Jesus as the king. They saw Jesus as the priest. But they missed that Jesus Christ was indeed the Messiah. The Savior of of the world. As we look into this portion of Scripture, we're going to see that prophecy is fulfilled. We're also going to see that there was a triumphant entry of Jesus Christ, but we're also going to see that there were some people who missed the message. They missed the mark. This morning, I want, us, I want to challenge us to not miss Jesus, but to see Him as He is. 
Rather than seeing Jesus' triumphal, triumphant entry for what it was, it was a fulfillment of prophecy. Many, including the religious leaders, were so concerned with keeping their own power and their own authority that they missed that this indeed was the Messiah. In verses 28 through 34, we see that prophecy was fulfilled. In Jesus' time, over 300 prophecies were fulfilled. Imagine that. Over 300 prophecies were fulfilled in the time of Jesus' life. 33 and a half years. And 300 prophecies were, uh, were uh, fulfilled. If the religious leaders would have been pay paying close attention, they would have seen that this man that claimed to be Jesus, that claimed to be the Son of God, was indeed the Son of God. But they were so worried about their own power and their own authority and their own rule system that they missed that this indeed was Jesus. Instead of seeing Jesus as the Messiah, they saw him as a threat. And they didn't want him to become their king. Here Jesus is going to fulfill prophecy as he enters into Jerusalem right upon this colt. But I think it's important to note where Jesus had just come from in Luke chapter 19. He was in the city of Jericho. And, and he met a man named Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus was a publican. He was a, he was a tax collector for the Roman government. Uh, the Jews would have hated this man. But Jesus saw him as more than a tax collector. They saw him, Jesus saw him as more than a sinner and saw him as someone who needed a savior. Even as Jesus is preparing to march to his death, he is always on mission. What does that mean for us? That means that as we see the time of his return approaching, we should be more expedient with the message that he's given us, and that's the gospel. Jesus always stayed on mission. And he always stayed with the message. Here we see that Jesus gives two of his disciples specific instructions. The first instruction was to go to the village, the, the other village, right? He, they weren't going into this village, they were going to the other village. And when you get there, when you walk into the city right there, there's going to be a colt tied up. And I want you to take that colt and I want you to bring him back to me. The, the important thing about this colt is though that it couldn't be ridden. It had to be a colt that had never been ridden. And then you're going to untie him and bring him to me. And then, this is funny, if anyone asks you, what, why, why are you taking my colt? Why are you taking my donkey? This is, that, that donkey belongs to me. You're just going to tell them that the Lord needs him. And this, the, the person who owns that donkey is just going to be like, okay, yeah, go ahead, take him. Imagine that. How many of you, uh, if you had your dog outside, or your cow, or your horse, or any of your animals outside, and someone comes up and says, hey, I'm going to take this, and I'm not going to ask, I'm just going to take. And uh, if anyone does ask, you just say, hey, Brother Cody needs it. And how many of you would just give your animal away? None of us, right? But these disciples went, and they did exactly what Jesus did. They did exactly as they were told. Imagine going to this village, and as you walk into the village, there's the cult that Jesus tells you about. Say, man, it's, Jesus really does know what's going on, doesn't he? And then, uh, not only was the colt there, but it, that this colt that is there had never been ridden by a man. Wow. Jesus really does know what he's talking about, doesn't he? And then, uh, tell you one further, I'm going to take this, I'm going to take this colt and I'm going I'm to go on my way. And, and so they untie him and they take him and then so the, the owners of this colt come up to him and say, hey, what are you doing with my colt? And they say, the Lord needs him and there, there's no other dialogue, is there? So obviously the man just let him go. And so this was fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah 9, 9, where it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. And so uh, Jesus was fulfilling the prophecy in Zechariah 9, 9. After this, the disciples bring the colt to Jesus, and they lay their coal their clothes, their garments, upon the colt and set Jesus upon the colt. Imagine as the disciples do all of this, I imagine they're thinking to themselves, wow, what a Savior. Wow. Jesus truly is God. You know, they had seen it over and over, right? They, they've been with Jesus for the last three and a half years. Jesus, uh, think... As Jesus is calling, we've been studying the book of Mark in Sunday school. And as Jesus called his disciples, they forsook everything and just followed him. They didn't ask any questions. They didn't, they didn't have any reserves. They didn't have any regrets. And so these men knew exactly who Jesus was. But as they get closer to his death, the more Jesus is showing himself as God. 
Right? The reason that God, that Jesus didn't show himself right away as God, he couldn't have, he, he could have just come as a full-grown man and just done the work that needed to be done. But no, Jesus experienced everything that these men had experienced. He'd been tempted. He'd been tested. He'd been hurt. He'd been, right? He, he, he felt every emotion that we feel. And the reason that Jesus came as a baby is so that he could feel all those emotions. Because Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. There's a hypostatic union. And this fully man and fully God were the same person. And so Jesus was showing them that he indeed is God. And then we see the entry into Jerusalem. There was some preparation for a king, wasn't there? They saw Jesus as a king, as we'll see a little bit later. But they put their clothes, they, they took their garments off, and they laid it upon the back of the colt, and they picked Jesus up and put him on top. And then if that wasn't good enough, they took the clothes that were left over that wouldn't cover the colt, and they laid them in the streets. They were preparing the way for the king. And when we think about John the Baptist, John the Baptist was there to prepare the way for the Lord. And when they were thinking about John the Baptist, and when he said that he was coming to prepare the way of the Lord, when, when the king would send someone ahead of him, they would fill in all the potholes in the streets. They would make sure that the town was ready to receive their king. And so these people were doing the same thing. They were making sure that Jerusalem was ready to receive their king. In John 12, it tells us that they cast palm branches at the feet of Jesus. This was showing uh, the palm branches were a sign of victory and triumph. They, they saw Jesus as king, but they missed. There's, there's, there's a portion of, uh, of Scripture, there's a portion of prophecy that they missed. They saw Jesus was going to be king, and Jesus one day will set up his throne here on earth, won't he? But there had to, there, something had to happen before that. Something that was prophesied in Genesis chapter number three fifteen, uh, when when they when Jesus was prophesied as as the one who would who would defeat Satan, and so something had to happen before Jesus was set to be king. But they saw Jesus as king, and they thought that Jesus was going to come in and throw off the Roman oppression. They thought that Jesus was going to, to, to come in and just set up his kingdom, and that was going to be the end of it. But that wasn't the purpose of Jesus coming at this time. Jesus reminds them just a few moments before of his purpose. Look at Luke chapter 19, verse number 10. It says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That was the purpose of Jesus coming this time. They missed it, though. They, they wanted a king. They wanted someone to throw off the Roman oppression. But Jesus came as a servant. Didn't he? Jesus didn't come to be served. No, Jesus came to serve. Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to pay for my sin debt. That's why Jesus came. And if you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ this morning, he can pay for your sin debt too. He, when, he, when he died on the cross, he gave us a blank check. There is no dollar amount that's too much for Jesus. There is no sin amount that's too much for Jesus. There, the money doesn't run out. Amen? Jesus had all, uh, all of God inside of him. And he, there was nothing that could keep Jesus from paying for our sins. They had the Savior of the world with them every day. They had seen the miracles that he had performed. And they had heard the message of Jesus. And, and yet they still missed it. Why? Because they saw the miracles as more important than the message. They saw Jesus doing all these great things. You know, He's healing people. He's uh, healing leprosy. He's bringing Lazarus back from the dead. He's doing all of these amazing things. And so they think, you know, uh, we don't need the, the Savior. No, we need the King. But that was not the time. It wasn't the time. Then we see that not only was there preparation for the King, there was the welcoming of the King. When He gets to town, He's greeted by people. And they're, they're excited for His entry. Right? And Jesus had received a triumphant entry. They were singing and praising God and, and yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And they, they, were, they were praising God and rejoicing for the mighty works that they had seen Him do. This again proves that they were so caught up in the miracles that they missed the message of Jesus Christ. In Matthew's account, in Matthew 21, they say that Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee, but he was not only a prophet, he was a priest and he was a king. He fulfilled all three roles, didn't he? And no other person had ever fulfilled all three roles. But Jesus Christ was prophet, 
priest, and king. In verse number 38 of our text, we see the multitude calling him king, and they talk about peace and heaven and the glory in the highest. Look at verse number 38. It says, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Turn with me over to Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2. Read verses 11 through 18. It says, Wherefore remember that being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by uh, that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of, of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off or made nigh by the blood of Christ. I'm thankful today that I am made close to God by the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ brought unity to us, didn't it? The, 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 blood, of, the blood of Christ put off circumcision and uncircumcision. No, we became one in Christ. Jesus brought unity. He brought peace. And it wasn't some peace that's going to fall away. No, this is a peace that God, that Jesus Christ made with God on our behalf. What caused the peace? The blood of Jesus that is interceding for us. And the, the blood paid the ransom. The blood paid the price of our sins. And so we are now unified with Christ. Verse number 14 says, For He is our peace. Amen? Let's talk about Jesus. Jesus is our peace who hath made one, who had made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Jesus Christ ripped the veil in two, didn't He? And there is, there is no more need for the high priest because we have the greatest high priest, and that's Jesus Christ, who is seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us on a daily basis. We don't need to go confess our sins to anyone else because Jesus is making intercession for us. Verse number 15 says, Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of, uh, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Aren't you thankful today that Jesus Christ came? And Jesus Christ... Uh, allowed us to have unity with the Father. If it wasn't for Jesus Christ shedding His blood on that cross, we would not have unity with God. If Jesus Christ would have not been buried for those three days and risen again on the third day, we would not have unity with Christ because Jesus paid for our unity through the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus was the peacemaker of heaven and earth. He is the mediator between God and man. He has brought us a peace that passes all understanding. Back in our text, we see the people are calling out Hosanna, which is an exclamation of praise to God. They saw Jesus for who He was. But you know, in the middle of all of that, there's some guys named the Pharisees. The Pharisees never could quite understand Jesus. They never could quite get why Jesus was doing what He was doing. Every time we see the Pharisees, they're always saying something dumb, aren't they? Then we think about in Luke chapter 15, they're talking about the prodigal son and all the things that are lost. But what, what was the very beginning of that story? Why did Jesus have to tell those stories? Because they looked at Jesus and they said, look at this man who eats with publicans and sinners. Why did Jesus come? Jesus didn't come to save those who didn't need to be saved. Right? Jesus came to save those who needed to be saved. And the difference between the Pharisees and those publicans and sinners is one of them knew they needed a Savior. Amen? And the other ones were so caught up in religion that they missed the fact that religion doesn't save you. It's only a relationship with Jesus Christ that saves us. In verse number 39, the Pharisees tell Jesus to rebuke His disciples for calling Him King. Imagine that. The, the Pharisees are going to rebuke the King of Kings and tell them, hey, these guys that are calling you King, you need to tell them to stop. You need to tell them to quit. And what did Jesus say? This is a great verse. This is this is, this is an amazing verse. Look at verse number 40. It says, And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if 
These, talking about the disciples, should hold their peace. The stones would immediately cry out. The stones would cry out. If we won't praise God, the stones will praise God. Can you believe that? The creation praises God. Every morning when we see that beautiful sunrise here in Texas, that's praising God. Every time we see that beautiful sunset as we look out across the plains of Texas, that is praising God. We see God in every aspect of creation. We see Jesus Christ as the creator of the world, the, 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 the God who spoke the world into existence. But the Pharisees missed it, didn't they? They saw Jesus as a threat, someone who was going to take their power and take their authority. But at the end of the day, they have no power. They have no authority. The only one who has power and authority is Jesus Christ. He is the one who has authority. Then you know, this, Jesus could have chosen anything to cry out praise to Him. He could have. He could make the pew that you're sitting in this morning cry praise to Him. He, he could make the very carpet. He could make the flowers. He could make anything cry praise to Him. But God chose us. Amen. God chose us. He, he could have chose anything. He could have chose our dog. Right? But God chose us to be able to praise God. And, and how many times do we miss an opportunity to praise Him? The Bible tells us to praise God in all things. And to, to praise Him. Even when things don't go the way that we think that they should, we should still be praising God because God means it all for our good. Then we think about Jesus weeping over the city. Verse number 41. And when we... Uh, and when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Imagine, as Jesus, the city he came to save, the people that he loved so dear, who rejected him. He came to his own, and his own received him not. Those same people Jesus is now weeping over. Why? Because they missed it. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And these people were just as lost as anyone else. But they missed the fact that they were lost. Jesus is weeping over a city. When's the last time we wept over someone who was lost? When's the last time we even thought about someone who was lost? We live in a world of 7 billion people. Think about this. 7 billion people. That's a lot of people. And I mean, we come in contact with not 7 billion every day, but we come in contact with hundreds, if not thousands of people every day. And every person has a soul. Every person. And that soul has two eternal destinations. There's heaven and there's hell. And we have the answer. We have, we have the answer to how they can get to heaven. It'd be like us seeing a building on fire and hearing people inside but telling no one that the building's on fire. The world is on fire today. We have the answer. We have Jesus. What are we going to do with Him? Why does Jesus weep? Because they had missed the reason for His coming. They missed the fact that it is prophesied that Jesus had to die to pay for our sins. They wanted to skip all of that and have Him set up His kingdom. The problem was that sin had not yet been paid for. When you think about the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, that was paying it forward, wasn't it? But Jesus paid it backwards and forwards. Jesus paid for all the sins of the world. They were just, uh, they, they were pushing it off till next year, pushing it off till next year, pushing it off till next year. But Jesus came and paid all of it. He paid the sin debt of every man. Remember that while these people are shouting Hosanna and praising Jesus as the king, here in just a few days, they, here in just a few short days, they're going to be crying crucifying. Turn over to Luke chapter number 23. Luke chapter number 23. Verse number 13, the Bible says in Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people said unto them, Ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people. And behold, I have examined him before you, have found no fault in this man, touching those things whereof ye accuse him. So that's talking about Jesus. That Pilate had found no fault in Jesus. In verse uh, number 15, it says, no, no, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. So here, Pilate is saying, hey, guys, I didn't find any fault. Herod didn't find any fault, so I'm going to reprimand him. I'm going to tell him, you know, don't do that again, and then I'm going to let him go. 
And then they said, in verse number 17, for of necessity he must release one unto them at the feast. And they cried out all at once, saying, away with this man and release unto us Barabbas. Imagine this. The man who was found no fault. The man who they were going to reprimand and send on his way. They, they are crying, they say, away with this man. Put this man away and give us Barabbas. Verse number 19, who for a certain sedition made in the city and for murder was cast into prison. So they're saying, give us the man who killed our, our, our own people and put this guy in jail who has done nothing but try to seek and to save that which was lost. Pilate, in verse number 20, says, Pilate, therefore willing to release Jesus, spake again unto them. He's saying, hey guys, did you miss it? Did you not hear what I just said? I just said, Jesus has no fault in this Barabbas guy. He's a murderer. And so he's, he's going to say it again. He says, uh, so he tells them again what he just said. But then in verse number 21, but they cried saying, crucify him, crucify him. And he said unto them the third time, why, what evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And the voice of them and of the chief priests prevailed. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. And he released unto them that for sedition and murder was cast into prison whom they had desired. But uh, he delivered Jesus to their will. And as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. So these people who had just been crying, Hosanna, Hosanna, are now crying, crucify him. Crucify him. Why? Because they missed it. They missed that Jesus was the Savior of the world. They saw Jesus as a vending machine, didn't they? They put their money in, and they pushed the button, and they got what they wanted. That's how they saw Jesus, but Jesus was much more than that. Jesus, indeed, was the Savior of the world. In conclusion this morning, think about this. The people missed the real Jesus because they were blinded by what they thought Jesus should be. They wanted to throw off Roman oppression. They wanted Jesus to set up his kingdom. They had the wrong picture of Jesus. This morning, are we trying to fix, fit God into a box? Are we trying to fit Jesus into a box? Are we saying, this is the Jesus that I want, nothing more and nothing less, because Jesus will never fit in our box. Why? Because Jesus' ways are not our ways. Jesus' thoughts are not our thoughts. No, Jesus is different. Jesus is the creator of the world. Are we seeing Jesus in this box? Are we seeing him as he is? Jesus is the savior of the world. Have you put your faith and trust in him? Jesus has been presented this morning, hasn't he? Jesus has been, uh, been put out there. Will you miss him? Are we going to miss Jesus? Are we going to see Jesus for who he is? Or will you choose this morning to put your faith and trust in him? This morning we can show you from God's word how you can be saved. Remember, when Jesus comes again, it will be to rule and to reign as king. But for now, we just wait for his coming. Let's all stand and we'll have a verse of invitation. And number 123 after we pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this day. God, thank you for all that you've done for us. I thank you for sending your son to die for us. I thank you that John 3.16 really is true, God, that you gave your son that whosoever believes in you should not perish but have everlasting life. God, if there's one here this morning that doesn't know you as their Savior, God, I pray that today would be the day that they surrender to you, God, and, and accept you as their personal Savior. God, be with us this invitation this morning. Just say a prayer. Amen.